Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're getting into lesson two tonight uh, on the Bible. Uh, we're going to be taking a, a, an overview look at the Bible, uh, what the Bible is, where the Bible comes from, and all sorts of things. Uh, getting into that opening paragraph there on your packet, if you can follow along, I'll read that for you. It says, this book is the all-time bestseller. It has been translated into virtually every language on earth. It can be found in many homes and even in most hotel dressers. But what is the Bible? And why is it worth our time and consideration? Some people believe that the Bible is just a collection of moral ideas and that wise men wrote down. Some believe it is much more. Which one is it? In this lesson and throughout our entire catechism class, we're going to be answering those questions. And uh, for those who are watching at home, and actually for uh, some of you as well, depending on what year you are taking this, whether you're in your first year or second year, you might also be asked to watch a an additional couple of videos uh, that go more in depth on the uniqueness of the Bible uh, and showing how the Bible really is like no other uh, piece of literature in world history. Uh, so much so that when you look at all that evidence about, about the Bible and its uniqueness, it does really help to show you that this isn't the ordinary work of men, that it is something that is inspired by God himself. And we'll get into that a little bit as well, too, here in our lesson tonight. So let's dive into part one. What is the Bible? And we have... A number of passages there. Uh, first of all, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. Macy, would you mind reading that, please? There is also another reason we give thanks to God unceasingly. Unceasingly. Unceasingly, namely, when you receive God's word, which you heard from us, you did not receive it as the word of men, but as the word of God, as it really is, which is not at work in you. Yeah, unceasingly means uh, that uninterrupted, it doesn't stop, it's ongoing. So you received our word, the Apostle Paul saying you received our message, not just as the words of men, but as the word of God itself. Uh, Jada, easy one, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed. Is God-breathed, meaning that God has inspired what was written in the scriptures. And then, the last one there, Hebrews 4, page. For the, for the word of God is living and active. Living and active. So according to the underlying portions of these passages, the Bible is the living and active word of God. Living and active word of God. <clears throat> Question 2. What does it mean that God's word is living and active? Does it mean that the Bible sprouts legs and walks around? So what does that mean? A difficult question, I'll admit. Not necessarily one I'd expect you to get. What it means is that the Bible, and here's your answer, has an impact on the hearts and lives of people. Okay? It has an impact on the hearts and lives of people. It also means that it is active in every period of world history, that it's, it's never dead or outdated. In fact, God's word itself says that it will never return to him empty, but will accomplish what he desires and achieve the purpose for which he sent it meaning that God's word is always going to have an effect on a person. Now, it could be that it strengthens them in their faith. It could also mean that it frustrates them or hardens them in their unbelief that they already have. God's word can do that as a punishment on a person in their unbelief. But it always has an effect. So, in short, it is the living and active Word of God. 
What is the Bible's purpose? Part two. A couple of passages there. Uh, first passage, Romans 15, verse 4. Jenica? For everything that was written in the past has written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Right. So while the, the Bible you know, is, by and large, it is a historical book, uh, but it also does have uh, sections where it is exclusively uh, doctrinal topics and uh, its teaching in nature. Even in the historical accounts, there is something that is being taught here. And we see there in Romans that the purpose of the Bible, first of all, is to teach us. First blank there, to teach us. And the second passage that we'll be considering is what specifically it teaches us. And we'll go to Aaliyah for 2 Timothy 3. And that from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God believed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So All right. So the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. So telling us about salvation, what we need to know for eternal life. And it comes to us through faith in Christ Jesus. So the first blank here, that the purpose of the Bible is to teach us the Christian faith. The Christian faith. But notice also, and I'm going to close this door here quickly. Uh, notice also the next part in verse, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is God-breathed. We had that earlier, inspired by God, and is useful for teaching, for rebuking. A rebuke is when you tell somebody to knock it off, that they're doing something wrong. Uh, correcting, meaning not just knock it off, but here's what you should be doing instead, and then helping someone to uh, train someone along in doing those good things. So now we're, we're shifting from faith to matters of daily living, and that's the other part here, the Christian faith and life. But the emphasis, as we heard last week in our lesson, the focus of the Bible, the emphasis in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is that it all points to Jesus, our Savior from sin. So, the Bible is the Word of God, is what it says. The Bible's purpose to teach us a Christian faith and life, which we had also heard about last week. Now, part three, who wrote the Bible? And the Bible, as it says there in the bold type, identifies three basic groups. Prophets, apostles, and evangelists. Now before I bring it up here, the, the key term, a prophet. Can somebody tell me what do they think a prophet is, or what does a prophet do? Ah, who knows what's going to happen in the future? I want to say predicts the future, but prediction has the element of uncertainty. Like, I think this is what's going to happen, but I'm not sure. Whereas prophecy is, you remove the element of uncertainty. Like, I think, I predict it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Pretty safe prediction based on the current forecast. But I don't know for certain. Maybe here's a better one. I predict that the smoke is going to clear up from those uh, Canadian fires. I don't know if that's going to be true or not. Um, but a little smoky out today, wasn't it? Again, there's an element of uncertainty. When the prophets told us what was going to happen in the future or made statements about what was going to happen in the future. It wasn't, I think this is going to happen. It's, this is going to happen. In fact, when you look at some of those prophecies, it's interesting. Think of Isaiah 53, uh, he, where it says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Raise your hand if you've heard those words before. Okay, not too many. Oh, those are some key words of the Old Testament. Who are they talking about, though, Jalen? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus. Yeah, talking about Jesus, right? What's the tense of the verbs being used? Past, present, or future? He was past. pierced past. When did Isaiah live? Before or after Jesus or during the life of Jesus? Anybody know? Repeated. When did Isaiah live? Before, during, or after Jesus was alive? No. Nope. 700 years before Jesus was born. And notice what he says. He was pierced. So Isaiah is talking in the past tense. In other words, he's talking as if these things about Jesus, which weren't going to happen for another 700 years, had already happened. It's called, uh, that's called prophecy right there. In fact, that's the word, uh, Quinn, that we use to talk about uh, making statements about future events and what's going to happen. A prophecy. However, what you identify as the work of a prophet is not the primary work of a prophet. But when we hear that word prophet, that's what we typically think about. The prophet, their primary function was to proclaim or speak or write God's word to God's people, usually publicly. That was their main function. That was their main function. The second one, second group of people who helped to write the Bible, the apostles. The word apostle is a Greek word that means one who is sent out. It comes from the Greek word apostello, which means to send out. And the word apostle is used in a of, in a couple of different ways. In one sense, it's used in a very broad way. It can refer to anybody who is sent out by someone else. However, and while the Bible does use it in that way, typically, though, when the Bible speaks about the apostles, it's talking about a very specific group of people, 12 or really you could even say 13 individuals, if you include the apostle Paul, which we do uh, who was tacked on to the group of apostles uh, a while after. But to be one of these apostles, you had to meet four requirements. One, you had to follow Jesus around during his earthly ministry. Two, you had to have been a witness of his resurrection. Not necessarily the, the moment that he rose from the dead, but that you saw him alive after he had been crucified died and was buried. And number three, Jesus had to have directly given you the command to go and make disciples of all nations, uh, to send them out into the world. And of course, number four, this one's a little bit assumed, you have to be a believer in Jesus. Uh, so those four requirements, but really the first three. The Apostle Paul is unique in that he did not follow Jesus during his earthly ministry. In fact, uh, for a while, and then even after Jesus had risen from the dead, Paul was a fierce opponent of Jesus and his church. It was only because Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus one day that Paul became a believer and kind of was uh, adopted into the group of apostles in that way. And uh, then uh, Jesus gave him a time of instruction and so on and so a different kind of apostle. Paul even acknowledges that. Um, some of the apostles uh, that wrote books of the New Testament, you would have Matthew. Matthew is an apostle. John would be an apostle. And Peter. Uh, these three that we have uh, books of the Bible named after, uh, these were apostles. And then you had a third group. And this third group, they were called evangelists. Uh, one who speaks or writes about the good news, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Evangelist comes from uh, two Greek words. Uh, oi, which is the adverb of good, meaning well. And angelos, which means messenger. We get the word uh, angel from angelos. Uh, oi, angelos, good or well message, good message, gospel, good news. Uh, these, those were the evangelists. Some of the evangelists would be Mark, okay? Mark's gospel. Now, interesting thing about Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel, it, it probably was one of those cases where, uh, let's say, I, I use my guinea pig. Guinea pig, you're Mark for right now, okay? And I'm Peter, and I, and I want you to write exactly what I tell you. Oh, you don't have it. It's already up there. So you're good. But you, you understand the point. You're writing, but I'm the one telling you what to write because I was the one who saw Jesus and followed him around. So that's Mark's gospel. It may be written by Mark, but it really, in many ways, is Peter's account of Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, so you've got Mark. You've got Luke. Okay? Luke, uh, he, he wrote the uh, gospel of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. Um, you also have James, the, the Bible book in the New Testament called James. That was written by Jesus' half-brother, James. The same with Jude, uh, the Bible book Jude, written by Jesus' half-brother, Jude. So you, you have these evangelists, and there were other evangelists as well who maybe didn't write anything that became a part of Scripture, but uh, were certainly going around and doing this work. Next set of passages. Let's see, how far, or who is the last one to read? Oh, you're the last one to read? So we got Jalen now? 2 Peter 1. No prophecy of Scripture comes about from someone's own interpretation. In fact, no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. All right. So prophecy can't come by the will of man. I mean, I think we all can agree on that, right? Can you, guinea pig, make an accurate statement about a specific person and a specific event in their life 700 years in the future? No, you can't. You need to have the, the, the knowledge and foresight of God to be able to do that, right? Because only God knows the future. So it can't come from the will of man. But then it says, men spoke from God as they were being carried along or being influenced by the Holy Spirit. And then the next passage, we've already had it, but we'll read it again. Good. Yep. Okay. All scripture is God breathed. God breathed or God inspired. Um, Quinn, or not Quinn, Graham. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is my Are you misbehaving there, Ladesha? Mm -hmm. Let's uh, stop bothering Caleb, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Graham, would you mind reading that again, please? The Spirit of the Lord speaks to me. His word is on my tongue. All right. Speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. So question number one here. According to the underlined portions of these passages, how can the Bible be the Word of God if it was written by men? Was that a hand page? No. How can the Bible be the Word of God if it was written by men? Quinn? Because God told them what to write. All right. That would be a good way of saying it. The Holy Spirit inspired the authors of the Bible to write the words that they wrote. Here's your answer. So, going back to the guinea pig, you're writing down words right now, right? Yeah? Whose words are you writing? God's. Well, <laughs> yours. My, yeah, I'm the one who put those words up there. You're not necessarily wrong. It's proclaiming the, the, the truths that God has revealed to us. I mean, I didn't come up with this on my own. The only reason I'm, I know this and I put this here is because God has revealed it to me. So, in a way, you could say God's. But, probably more specifically, at least in this moment, because, uh, you know, we don't have a book of the Bible called the First Aaron, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, that is my first name, by the way. These words are mine. And you 
are writing them down. And what we are talking about here is something called verbal inspiration. And there's that next key term. And this is the miracle by which it says God breathed into the prophets, the apostles, and the evangelists what he wanted them to write in the Bible. It is called verbal inspiration to show that God guided them to use the exact words he wanted them to write. Now, how exactly that process looked like is difficult for us to understand. Was God directly talking to them like I am to you right now? Was he influencing their thoughts? Or was he actually maybe taking over and taking control of them while they wrote? We, we don't really know. But what is really interesting here is that when it comes to Scripture and the writing of Scripture, God often worked through the writing styles and language abilities of the individuals. For example, uh, the Apostle John, um, by no means was he a master of the Greek language. Greek was his second language. Uh, in fact, you read John's Gospel, and in many respects, it's like reading Greek for dummies. Uh, very simple, basic Greek. In fact, when I was at Martin Luther College and I was learning Greek, the first book of the Bible that we took a crack at translating, and they still do it to this day, is John's Gospel because it is very simple Greek. And yet, what's interesting is that it conveys some of the deepest theology in all the Bible. Simple words, simple language, simple sentence structure, but deep, deep teaching that has a lot of meaning to it, um, especially when it comes to the person and the nature of Jesus Christ. Then you get a guy like Luke. Okay? Luke, probably nobody here knows about Luke, but I'll give you a chance. Does anybody know what Luke did for a living, what his profession was? Very good. Somebody got it. Yeah, Luke was a doctor. So that guy was edumacated. He knew a few things, didn't he? He's smart. And when you are well-versed, when you are educated, you've done a lot of reading, your vocabulary becomes much more expansive, right? You're not just using simple uh, language. You're using bigger words, and that's Luke. Uh, he, he has much, much, much more complex Greek than John does. And yet God still works through those writing styles and uh, their understandings of the language in which they wrote uh, to share and reveal his word to us. A um, lot, of, lot of interesting things about that. Um, anyway... Question number two, because the Bible is verbally inspired, which statement is more accurate? The Bible contains God's word or the Bible is God's word? Which one would be the better of the two statements? The Bible contains God's word or the Bible is God's word? She just kind of tries, she's thinking, she's cautious. I'm a first-year student, so I don't really know if I should be sticking my neck out. And what, what is it? The Bible is God's word. Is God's word. Okay, defend your answer. Because God told the prophets and the apostles what to write, like in multiple ways. All right. And they wrote it into the Bible. Okay. Now, I'm going to take the other side just for a moment. I'm not saying if you're right or wrong yet. Let's say... Well, you're saying that it's is and not contains. What is the problem, from your point of view, with saying that the Bible contains God's word? And if somebody else wants to help out, they can. Jalen. If it contains it, it might have other stuff in it, too. Right? Sounds good? I, I, I'm going to agree with her. Yeah, the Bible is God's word. 
By the way, you don't need to write this part in brackets. Um, I just put that there as a visual note for you that contains, says, or implies exactly what Jalen just said, that it has things that are not God's word. The quest, now, if you're going to make the case that the Bible only contains God's word, what's the problem? How do we know which part of the Bible is God's word and which part isn't God's word? How do we know that? How can we know that, right? Unless if God directly says, we've got to listen to John 1 verse 1, but don't listen to John 1 verse 3. And God doesn't do that in the Bible at all. So who ultimately then becomes the authority on deciding whether or not uh, it is God's word if we say that the Bible just contains God's word? Who, who gets to make that decision? Ultimately, it, it falls on, on humans, on us, people. And then what we end up doing is we end up treating God's word like a pizza ranch buffet. That, okay, I like this part of the Bible. This is God's word. That part over there, nah, not so much. I'm going to leave that out. That can't be God's word. I just, I don't agree with that. So I'm going to skip over it. So then you, you treat it like a buffet. You pick what you like. You skip what you don't. Who likes pizza ranch? Yeah, good. I was actually there on, uh, on Monday. We almost never go to pizza ranch, but. We ended up going there for lunch. Um, not a big fan of their pizza. Their chicken's a lot better than the pizza. You good? What's that? Everything else besides the pizza? <laughs> yeah. I like the chicken the most uh, there. They got some pretty decent chicken. There's better fried chicken out there, but it's not bad. So, okay. Anyway, if the Bible, part four, is God's word... What does this tell us about it? There are a number of things. First of all, Titus 1, verse 2. Brody. Based on the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie. Promise recorded. All right, God cannot lie. Numbers 23, 19, Caleb. God is not, man, not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he changes his mind. All right, so pausing there just for a moment. What does the Bible say that God never does? Or never, yeah, God does not ever do? That way. He doesn't lie. So the first key term for us is that the Bible is inerrant, meaning that it is without error. It is accurate in all of its historical information, and it does not contradict itself. A couple of things to mention there. First of all, accurate in all of its historical information. Archaeology continues to be one of the Bible's best friends. Archaeology, you dig up the past, right? Um, there are so many things that archaeology has discovered, which, and every time there's an archaeological discovery that connects to the Bible, it confirms the historical account of the Bible. And it's really incredible um, when, when you think about it because uh, there are so many people who have taken pot shots at the Bible and said, oh, the Bible can't be true, it can't be right because it used to be we had no record outside of the Bible of a guy named Pontius Pilate. By the way, who is Pontius Pilate? You all should know this one. Page. The guy that crucified Jesus on the cross. Yeah, remember... Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor in Judea at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, at the time he was crucified. People said, well, there was no Pontius Pilate. We don't have any record of him. The Bible's wrong. And then in, 19, in the 1960s, at Caesarea Maritima, which was a a city along the Mediterranean coast in Israel that Herod the Great had built. He built a big port city. Uh, I've actually been there before. A stone that had been repurposed as a stone for steps 
was turned over because they recognized, okay, this stone, it doesn't make sense that it's here. And back then, by the way, you don't just throw stones away. You, uh, big stones like this, you, you try to repurpose them, and they repurpose it into a step. They turned it over, and there was writing on the other side dating back to the time of Jesus. And, that, and in that writing was the name Pontius Pilate. And so you got the Pilate stone. I saw the replica of it at Caesarea Maritima back in 2018. They took the real one and put it in the museum to keep it safe. But they got a replica on display out there. Um, or, as I was going through in Bible class today, for a long time, uh, it used to be a long time ago, Bible critics said, Bible can't be right. It talks about this big city called Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, but we have no evidence of Nineveh. In fact, uh, the Greek historian Xenophon, when he went by the supposed area where Nineveh existed, uh, there was no mention of Nineveh in any of his records. If Nineveh is true, it, he would have mentioned it. Well, Nineveh was so completely destroyed in 612 B.C., that not long after, the, the, the dust and the sands of nature had completely covered it, and all memory of Nineveh was lost for many centuries in that part of the world until it was eventually rediscovered. Um, and we know Nineveh existed. It's been dug up. But you, you do this time and time and time again. I could talk about uh, the, the stone in Dan up in northern Israel that dating back uh, about 800 years before the time of Christ, that talks about the house of David. Historically accurate, time and time again, without contradiction. A lot of times you, you, you will eventually hear people say that the Bible contradicts itself. But then when you press them on that and say, okay, how does it contradict itself? Uh, the, the vast majority of these apparent contradictions that I have heard are very easily explained and reconciled. There is no contradiction at all. You just haven't uh, done enough study on the scriptures. There are no contradictions. Next set of passages. Uh, Isaiah 65, verse 16. Madesha. Now, can you read louder so I can hear you, please? So that anyone on earth who blesses himself will bless himself by the God of Amen. And anyone on the earth who swears will swear by the God of Amen. Now, if you look at the footnote at the bottom of the page, we're uh, talking about that phrase, the God of Amen. Uh, amen is a, a word that could also be used to refer to or uh, related to the word truth. And so you could say then it's by the God of truth. John 17, 17, Macy. Sin? Sanctify. Sanctify. Yeah, God's word is truth. The Bible says, how do we know the Bible is true? Because the Bible says it's true. Hmm, interesting. Where have I heard that line of thought, or that line of reasoning before? We'll come back to that. Jada, next passage, Proverbs 30. Every word of God is flawless. Flawless. So, again, the next key term we say that the Bible is infallible, meaning that everything it teaches is true and that it can never fail us. Not just true in its historical information, but true in the things that it teaches us for uh, faith about God, for what God wants us to do and what he does not want us to do. And if you think about these first two, this is a pretty outrageous claim that the Bible is making. I mean, it's really putting itself out there when it says that. Basically, it's saying, you know what? Take your best shot. Do whatever you can to discredit the Bible. If you can find anything in the Bible that is untrue, you can be, you, you, you can dismiss its authority. In fact, you can reject the entire Bible itself, is what it's saying. But before you try to go down that path, let me tell you this first. The Bible's been around for 2,000 years. Do you really think that 
people throughout these last 2,000 years haven't done their darndest to try to discredit the Bible, to find errors in it. The Bible is by far the most scrutinized book in human history. Every sort of attack that you can imagine has already been carried out against the Bible and successfully refuted. So any sort of, of doubt or question that you might have about the Bible at some point in your life, whether it's right now or years from now, has already been thoroughly handled, answered by the Bible itself and by other theologians. So keep that thought in mind if you ever have struggles in your faith about what the Bible is saying. That whatever struggle you have is not unique to you. You have not discovered anything that hasn't already been resolved. And that is the, the incredible thing about the Bible. And if it is all accurate like this, that really indicates to us who the author is, that it's God. The last term is that the Bible is sufficient, meaning that it tells us everything that we need to know for salvation and godly living. It might not tell us everything we want to know. You know, what is heaven going to be like? The Bible does give us some broad pictures and descriptions of it, but it leaves out some of those specific particulars that we're curious about. But it tells us everything that we need to know. Getting back to John 17, verse 17. How do we know that the Bible is true? So far, our answer to that question is, because the Bible says that it's true. Or, to phrase it another way, how do we know that the Bible is God's word? Because the Bible says it's God's word. That is an odd line of thinking and reasoning. And it's one of those that was actually used once and made fun of in a State Farm commercial. You remember, you know, you, you guys know State Farm Insurance Company, right? And they have these funny commercials and whatnot. We're going to watch one of those older commercials. Uh, some of you from last year might remember this. Um, we're going to watch one of those older State Farm commercials that talks about this and, and kind of makes fun of it a little bit, all right? Hey, Mike, where do you have to? Uh, just diagramming this accident with my State Farm Pocket Agent app. Hmm. You can also get a quote and pay your premium with this thing. I thought State Farm didn't have all those apps. Where'd you hear that? The internet. And you believed it? Yeah. They can't put anything on the internet that isn't true. Where'd you hear that? The, the internet. internet. Oh, look. Here comes my date. I met him on the internet. He's a French model. Uh, bonjour. State Farm. More mobile than ever. Get to a better state. You guys believe that guy is a French model? If he is, then I am one also. <laughs> Don't laugh too hard at that. They wouldn't put anything on the internet that isn't true. Where'd you hear that? The internet. God's word is true. Where'd you hear that? The God's word. It's the same line of logic, isn't it? Now, just because the internet says that well, according to her in the commercial, just because the internet says that there's nothing on the internet that isn't true, does that make it correct? No. Obviously not. Yeah. I mean, the, the evidence speaks for itself. There's loads of things on the internet that aren't true. In fact, sometimes it is, um, there are things out there that are deliberately false and misleading, uh, and it's designed to confuse people and create controversy and tension and, and whatnot. But really, the line of arguing that she, and reasoning that she is using is no different than the line of reasoning that we have been using so far here based on God's Word. How do we know that God's Word is true? Because it says it's true. Well, what makes the Bible different than the Internet? It came from God. How do we know? How does the Bible show us that? Because the internet shows itself to be filled with errors, right? How does the Bible show itself to be true? 
Macy, you were, did I see you starting to raise your hand earlier? No? Okay. And this goes back to some of the things I've been sharing earlier. And if you end up watching the additional two videos, uh, supplemental videos to this lesson, I, I go into a bit more depth and detail about this very thing. That, um, yes, the Bible says it's true, or we believe the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true. However, the Bible in many ways reveals itself to be true. One of those big ones, uh, Paige, we, we talked about a little while ago, and that is the accuracy of prophecy. Depending on whom you ask uh, and, and how you decide to uh, figure out uh, the number of prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, very narrowly you could say specifically maybe 48 prophecies. However, I've also heard people say that there could be anywhere between 300 and 600 prophecies. Because uh, sometimes prophecies are repeated by different people at different times. Are you going to count those as two individual ones or as as just one prophecy, see, and, that, and that's why you, you have those differences in, in numbering. But you have loads and loads of prophecies about Jesus, and the biblical record shows that all of those prophecies came true. And what's incredible about that is that in some cases, you know, now in some cases, Jesus could easily have maneuvered his life and the things going on to fulfill them. Like, uh, behold, your king comes to you, you know, riding on a donkey, the colt, the foal of a donkey. When, uh, what, what event in, on the uh, church calendar do we celebrate Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey? What was that, Ladesha? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, yeah. Now, is it easy for Jesus to find a, a donkey and plop himself on it and go riding into Jerusalem? Yeah, that's easy. Hey, look at that. I fulfilled the prophecy. Okay. Some of the prophecies, however were not so easy. Some of them were not what Jesus would do, but what would be done to Jesus. Getting back to the one we heard earlier from Isaiah, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. This isn't what Jesus is doing, this is what was done to Jesus. And do you think that his enemies would want to have a hand in helping Jesus fulfill the prophecies? No, they're his enemies. They're not going to help him out. And yet they did exactly that. Now, let's... Um, I, I once heard this thing, and again, it's in uh, those additional videos, but just to illustrate how incredible this is, a mathematician once took uh, and crunched the numbers and said, for Jesus to fulfill just eight prophecies in the Old Testament about him. To say nothing about the 48 or potentially hundreds. Just eight. The odds of that happening, of one person fulfilling just eight prophecies, is one in 100 quadrillion. Do you not understand what that number is? So you've got, you know, the ones, the tens, the hundreds, thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, million, ten millions, hundred millions, billions, and then after the hundred billions, trillions, after hundred trillions, quadrillion. One in one hundred quadrillion. That is a one with, I think, 16, or 15 or 16 zeros after it. To illustrate what that is like, okay, if you took silver dollars and laid them out across the state of Texas, you know how big Texas is. You would cover it to a depth, I believe, of two feet. That's what 100 quadrillion looks like. Now, take one of those silver dollars and mark it and put it out there somewhere. And we're going to take our guinea pig, we're going to blindfold her, going to send her out into the great state of Texas and say, okay, find the right one, and you get only one shot. What are the odds that you are going to pick the right one? So small, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. Right? And that's just eight prophecies. That is 
nowhere close to the hundreds. And that is interesting. You know, this, the, the, the prophecies especially, but also the lack of contradictions, shows us that the Bible is like no other book. Because, um, have you guys ever heard of the Koran at all? No? Quinn, what is the Koran? It's the Muslim Yeah, it's the equivalent of the, the, of the Bible in the Muslim or Islamic faith, right? The Quran has a number of either historical inaccuracies. Uh, they, they record that uh, Christians believe that the Virgin Mary is part of the Trinity. <laughs> nope. Uh, there's historical inaccuracies. It also has contradictions. In one, uh, in, yeah, in one account of the Israelites you know, crossing through the waters of the Red Sea, they say that Pharaoh died. In another account of it, elsewhere in the, the Quran, Pharaoh lives. Which one is it? Right, the law of contradiction, of non-contradiction says you can't have both. It has to be one or the other. Well, how did this oops happen? <laughs> Maybe it tells you that it's not written by God. Interestingly enough, uh, the, the Quran has this little built-in fail-safe in the event that any of these oopsies ever came up. I believe it's in the second surah, or second book of the Quran, And it, it's a statement that says, uh, if anything that is written contradicts what was previously written, the new writing supersedes or overrides what was previously written. So, in case if I contradict myself, we're going to go with what I said, the, the newer thing that I said, and ignore the older thing. Now, if you're God, Paige, are you going to need to have a little uh, uh, built-in fail-safe like that to correct any mistakes? No, because you're not going to make mistakes, because you're God. But that's the Quran. The Bible doesn't have that. The Bible doesn't need it. So, okay, quick Bible breakdown. Oh, we're getting to this one. Second-year students, you are not allowed to answer this one. Oh, oh I know. What are the two main parts of the Bible? And I, I, am, I am so emphasizing this here because every year, without fail, whenever I ask this question, and it happened last year, you guys might remember, it also happened this year in this class, somebody who shot his hand up was confident that he knew the answer, and I knew that he was going to give me the wrong answer, and he did not disappoint me. And the two that were so confident here initially have now put their hands down like, oh, maybe I don't know what the two parts of the Bible are. Guinea pig, this is your moment to shine. You are the first one to raise your hand. Paige, can you tell us what are the two main parts of the Bible? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Lady Grace. What were you going to say? Graham? Old Testament and New Testament. Cha-ching. Did you know that or did you guess? I knew it. You knew it, yes. Mm. Can you guess what kids normally say, Ladesha? Isn't it Jalen? Like God and Jesus? Nope. Gospel and law. Long gospel, yeah. The two main doctrines of the Bible. These are the two main parts. Wow. I, I'm having a moment here. This is a great moment that public school students got this answer where Lutheran elementary school students haven't. Nice, well, public school student. You're homeschooled. But I'm still going to give you a fist bump. Nice work. Yeah, good job. Now, if you were really paying attention and you looked right beneath this, you'd see those two parts uh, clearly broken down in that chart that I share. Um, I've already got all this stuff, this information written for you into your packet so you don't have to be getting writer's cramp. But this is a quick little summary of uh, the, the two different parts of the Bible. So the Old Testament, written primarily by Moses, the kings, and the prophets. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He also wrote Psalm 90. Um, and then the kings and the prophets wrote uh, the other ones in the Old Testament. The New Testament written by the apostles and evangelists. The language of the Old Testament, almost all of it is Hebrew. Some of the books that were written after the Jews came back from exile in Babylon, um, parts or all of them were written in Aramaic. Um, Aramaic is related to the Hebrew language. It's kind of like Spanish and Portuguese, similar but different. Uh, Aramaic was the lingua franca or the universal language of the Middle East in ancient times. And that's what the Jews were speaking at the time of Jesus. They weren't speaking Hebrew anymore. They were speaking Aramaic. The New Testament written initially all in Greek. The Old Testament contains 39 books. The main topics there, history, poetry, and prophecy. The New Testament much shorter, not just in length, but also a number of books, 27 of them. Again, history, but then letters and prophecy. The timeline of the Bible uh, in the Old Testament. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, was uh, start. It began, Moses started writing it approximately the year 1450 BC. We would probably say sometime after 1446 BC, because that is the year that generally held or believed to be the year of the Exodus from Egypt. Going all the way to 400 BC, uh, 400 years before the time of Christ, and that's what BC means. The New Testament, much smaller time period, 40 AD to 90 AD. And as you can see here, AD does not mean after death. A lot of times when you ask people what AD means, they say after death, referring to after Jesus died. Well, no. Because think about it. You got, you know, 3 BC, 2 BC, 1 BC. Jesus was born right around that time. Well, it's not like he was born and instantly died. He lived for uh, 33 plus years. What do you call those years while Jesus is alive, if not B.C., and obviously not A.D.? You know, well, it doesn't make sense. A.D. refers, is Latin. It means anno domini, meaning in the year of our Lord. Question, what year, about what year do we think, uh, not just that we think, but uh, around what year was Jesus crucified? It's good and helpful to know that question. Around what year? Ladesha, you kind of got it? No? What year do you think Jesus was crucified in? Nobody? Okay, what? okay. I have one question before I leave. Before we get to that, okay. So, if it, like the years, did it go... 3 B.C., 2 B.C., 1 B.C., and then 1 A.D., 2 A.D., 3 A.D., and so on. And we're in the year 2023 A.D. Sometimes people will say now uh, that B.C. stands, or B.C., they'll do B.C.E., which is before Common Era, and then C.E., Common Era. You might have heard those, uh, but really, they're just kidding themselves because what is the focal point upon which uh, the history hinges? from before common era to common era. It still focuses on Christ, doesn't it? You could try to remove Christ from the terminology, but it's still there. So getting back to my question, in around what year was Jesus crucified? You don't remember? Depending on who you ask, I mean, we don't know exactly. Um, based on... It, historical evidence that I have looked at regarding events and circumstances, I do believe that he was crucified right around the year 33 AD. 33 AD. But there are others who will say and make the case, and not without merit, for 30 AD. But either way, within that those few years right there is when Jesus was crucified. The first book of the Bible being written 40 AD, maybe a little bit after that. We're talking 
a decade, maybe a little more. For you guys, that might seem like a long time because, well, Jenica, how old are you? Twelve. Twelve. Okay, so you're only a couple of years beyond a decade, your whole life. That seems like a long time to you. So wait till you get a little bit older. Ten years ain't going to seem so long. Okay? Ten years is not that much time in the grand scheme of things, and it flies by pretty quick. That is a short time interval, and that is very important. And again, in that, the supplemental video lessons, I do talk about time interval between when the events happened and when they were first being written down and recorded. Last part here, content, history of God's people, Israel, and the promises of the Savior to come. And then the New Testament, the good news about Christ, and then the history of the early church and letters to those churches. So to visually summarize this, the top one, top row here is the Old Testament, the bottom row of the New Testament. You have Genesis through Deuteronomy, the first five books, like I said, written by Moses. The next set of books are historical, covering from the time when the Israelites entered into the Promised Land under the uh, leadership of Joshua, all the way to the time of uh, Esther, who was one of the queens in Persia, a Jewish queen in Persia, uh, around uh, in the 400s BC. After that, you have what are called the books of wisdom literature, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And then you have the major prophets. In the major prophets, there is some historical information recorded, but um, not as often. Um, and they're called major because their books are bigger than the minor prophets that come after them. Um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, that's not a dude, that's just the, the name of the book. We believe Lamentations was written by Jeremiah, that's why it's there. Ezekiel and Daniel, those are the major prophets, and then the last ones here, uh, we call them the minor prophets again, simply just because, for the most part, their works were shorter in length, not because they were any less important. Getting into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are what are called the Gospels, and the Gospels cover the life and the ministry of Jesus. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are often referred to as the synoptic Gospels, um, meaning together with the same eye. Uh, and the reason why they're called that is because they cover a lot of the same stories and content uh, that the, others, the other three do, or the other two. John's Gospel is a bit different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, so it's not a synoptic, but it, it covers more of the theological side of things, the person and nature of Christ. The book of Acts is the historical account of the early Christian church following Jesus' ascension into heaven, going all the way to when the Apostle Paul arrived in Rome. <laughs> then this next big block here, these are called, uh, from Romans to Philemon, the Pauline epistles, because they were written by the Apostle Paul. And then the last group here, um, we're not really sure who wrote Hebrews, uh, James, Peter, or 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. Uh, the, the authors are basically self-explanatory. And then the last book, Revelation, written by the Apostle John, uh, talking about um, the uh, end times. And we'll cover the end times a bit more as we get further into our lessons. Any questions on the books of the Bible at all? Okay. So, really, what is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? And here's another one of those things, pay attention, that people, I always get somebody who gets this wrong when they do their homework, when they do the worksheet, always, and without fail it happened again this year in the school. They think that the Old Testament is all law and the New Testament is all gospel. Nothing could be further from the truth. In the Old Testament, you have gospel. In the New Testament, you have law. 
So Old Testament has both law and gospel. New Testament has both law and gospel. You have God's condemnation on sin in both the Old and New Testaments and God's promises of grace, mercy, and forgiveness in both Old Testament and New Testament. The only difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is when they were written. The Old Testament was written before Jesus came to earth. The New Testament was written after Jesus came to earth. And so then, really, all that happens is the Old Testament points forward to what Jesus would do for us, whereas the New Testament points us back to Jesus and his accomplished work. That is the only difference. So, hopefully you guys can be the first class that breaks the trend. Because it's amazing, no matter how much I talk about this, no matter how much I emphasize this, that Ladesha is going to get this wrong, that <laughs> and she's going to say that the Old Testament is all law, the New Testament is all gospel. No, not true. You're kind of offended? Well, consider it a challenge. Okay? All right. Last part here of our lesson for today. Warnings about tampering with God's word. Yes, Caleb? I already got the answer to it. I'm sure you do. So but we're going to read the Bible passages anyway. Where did we leave off for reading? Was Macy the last one to read, or did we make it past? Jada? Okay, Jada, Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. All right, so do not add, do not subtract from this word. Page, similar thought now in Revelation. I give this warning to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add him to the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and in the holy city, which are written in this book. Okay, Caleb, so according to the bold portions of these passages, God warns us not to what? Add or subtract. Add to or subtract from the Bible. In other words, what it's saying is, do not teach things that the Bible doesn't teach and say that they come from God. Do not make statements saying that these are... Things that God teaches us when he does not, in fact, teach us those things. The Pharisees in the New Testament, these guys were insanely good at adding to the Bible. The Pharisees didn't think that the Ten Commandments went far enough. So the Pharisees came up with 613 extra rules and traditions for the people to follow and said that this comes to you from God, and you are required to follow these things to get to eternal life, which also is a, a wrong statement. Mm -hmm. So, don't add to what the Bible says. Yes, Quinn? What about Catholics? Explain more, please. Because they have more books in the Bible than us? Oh, you're talking... Enlighten the rest of the class as to what you are talking about. What do you mean extra books of the Bible? More than that, do you know what they're called? No. They make up a body of work called the Apocrypha. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha, no doubt, is a, a good source of historical information. But, in the end, we would say, and every other Christian church body would say, they are not part of Scripture for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the biggest of all is because there are um, obvious contradictions between them and the works of the Bible itself. Um, as I recall, historically, the Catholic Church never really settled on officially saying that the Apocrypha was a part of the Bible until the Council of Trent in the year 1546, so 1,500 years after the time of Jesus. Don't quote me on that. Uh, you guys, don't quote me on that internet. 
Um, I could be mistaken in that, but I do believe that that is the case. Um, I will admit that the Apocrypha is not an area where I am well equipped to, to respond to more in-depth and detailed things, but uh, some of their teachings uh, that, that the Catholic Church has are derived from the Apocrypha. Yes, so good example. Subtracting from God's word, meaning taking things out of God's word that we uh, because we don't like them or we don't agree with them. Again, that is kind of the adopt a, uh, a buffet approach to interpreting or to uh, reading the Bible. That I pick what I like, I skip over what I don't like. And there are plenty of examples of those who subtract out there. And God is serious about this. We see how serious he is in uh, especially Revelation, uh, the warnings that he gives. So to finish this lesson up, got this chart here, the verbal inspiration of God uh, guiding or reminding the, the people, the men writing, of the Bible, guiding their thoughts and their words. Um, and by the way, we believe, I think it's about 40 individuals who wrote the Bible. And all these things, yes, written by men, but they, the words themselves came from God. No errors, no promises uh, that haven't been kept or won't be fulfilled in the future. But again, don't add, subtract, or change anything. Uh, we want to treat God's word with the respect that it's due. Any questions at all? All right, let's close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all. Amen. Have a good night, everybody.